up next on the Canna Cribs podcast. Uh, so, um, so this is what we see most commonly as a, as an issue in the post harvest process, and we'll talk about how to keep keep uh, mitigate the risk of spoilage during drying, but. Time of harvest. Um, when when do you think is the best time to harvest? There's a lot of ways to decide when to harvest your crops for growers. It's, it's nearly possible. Uh, you know, I've, I've never suggested that to a commercial grower, but at home, like I'll play around with it. Hey, I'm Nick, creator of Canna Cribs and Growers Network, where we have educated millions of people on how to elevate their craft. I have toured some of the largest grow operations befriended the best growers, and built a network of the top cannabis companies. Join me on this next adventure where I document history with the pioneers shaping the global cannabis industry in real time. Welcome to the Cannacribs Podcast. The Cannacribs Podcast is brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have five categories you want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticultural Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Post Harvest by Green Grows, and Dispensary by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create the podcast and bring more knowledge to the world. If you want to support the Cannacurs podcast, head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. Where, where are you uh, calling in from? I'm in uh, Kelowna, BC, just a couple of hours north of uh, Vancouver. Okay, right on. And yeah, I, I got to uh, speak with Philip, interviewed him recently on all things canopy management. And uh, you are uh, one of three partners at Sustanza Global. Yeah, that's right. Myself and uh, Juan Gutierrez and uh, Philip Metz. Right on. So uh, do you guys have uh, a different focus for each partner or all three of you uh, service all of your clients? Uh, we all have different specialties, um, just more specific, uh, kind of very, uh, you know, like Philip is very focused on kind of the data, uh, aspect of cultivation and horticulture and, uh, Juan is more on operations and I'm more kind of on the academic research and, um, and understanding the plant kind of from a very basic level kind of thing. So we all complement okay. each other, but uh, we all have basis, uh, basic understanding the foundations of horticulture and operations. Awesome. And um, in our research, we found out that you earned North America's first ever PhD uh, with research focus on indoor cannabis production. Um, can you tell me how that came to be? Yeah, uh, it's kind of a right place, right time kind of thing. Um, I was studying, uh, I was studying controlled environment plant production uh, in university at the University of Guelph in Ontario. And okay. uh, the lab that I worked in is, is focused on uh, producing high value crops in, in harsh environments, controlled environments. So uh, they were looking at producing plants in the deserts, or they were, you know, working with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency with on how to produce plants in space or on uh, different planets or on the space station, things like that. So we were working in these very highly controlled environments, and the only, not the only, but one of the very few crops that uh, growers will actually elect to use some of this high tech equipment. Uh, on a commercial scale is in cannabis yeah. and at, at the time there was no um there was no legal production of cannabis other than on the uh, medical side in canada uh but luckily i was able to kind of to work with my with my advisor uh dr even zhang and, and uh start working with one of the medical producers in canada to do similar research that we did in these other crops but do it on on the drug type cannabis on thc cannabis and um yeah, it was really interesting. So I started, um, I started out in the masters, and the, the beautiful thing about working with cannabis is that there was effectively no research uh, in the area. There was some research in the '70s, right. and um, we really didn't know from an intellectual level how to grow this crop. There's tons of legacy growers that were doing it pretty effectively, uh, mostly not at scale, but they still had a really good understanding of the crop. And um, and so, kind of my role there was to try and bring over some of these modern high-tech agricultural practices, horticultural practices to cannabis and try and uh, help growers produce it at scale, uh, be more effective and efficient in their production facilities, uh, be less wasteful and produce a higher a higher quality crop. And uh, specific areas I was working on were uh, fertilization, uh, irrigation practices, propagation, so we looked at uh, cloning and 
the last thing we touched on was uh, controlled stress, which was a really interesting one. And wow. like you said, yeah, I was lucky, lucky enough to be the first uh, to get a PhD in the area. Yeah, um, I mean, that's groundbreaking. Uh, mm-hmm, that is cool. history uh, in the making right there. And how many other uh, indoor cannabis cultivation PhDs are out there after yourself? Uh, I know I know of one, I think. It's wow. not it, it's, it's not a common um yeah, it, it, there's still not really any programs doing it. This was kind of like a special mm-hmm. case and the other person was also from my lab who graduated a year after me uh who's now working at Fluence as um, head of uh, head of R&D. So. Wow. Well, that would be yeah. a, a good place to go. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, soon after uh, your university days, you went over to lead operations at the Kelowna Research Station. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that, that was part of a role uh, when I was working for the Flower Corporation. So uh, Flower is a uh, licensed cannabis producer based where I live now in Kelowna, BC. Uh, and they have operations in right here in Kelowna. They have a, a large indoor facility. Uh, greenhouses and outdoor sites and also operations in Portugal. Uh, so I was director of research and development at Flower, so I led a team of scientists and operators and really honed in on uh, improving efficiencies in their, in their cultivation practices and um, increasing yield, quality, consistency of the product. That was kind of my main focus there. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of why I wanted to join Flower was because they had this uh, early partnership with uh, the Hawthorne Gardening Company. That's she what might. it was. It it rang a bell. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So they're they're a subsidiary of Scotts Miracle Grow. I'm sure you know that. Um, mm-hmm. And basically, Scotts or or Hawthorne wanted to do similar research that they do on their other products. Uh, so like they, you know they do grass seed and fertilizer and Miracle Grow things like that. Uh, and they put a lot of rigor into developing those products and improving them. But they couldn't do that with their cannabis products because um, they didn't. Have, they weren't legally allowed to do the research in the U.S. Yeah, regulations. So, yeah. so they partnered with what they considered uh, kind of the top licensed producer in, I, I think we have a very academic, like science-based approach at Flower, um, and part of that was the R&D team. And, and so my role was to, to help them build um, this, the Kelowna Research Station, which is right beside Flower's indoor facility. And that's the that was the first facility dedicated to cannabis cultivation research, and still is, uh, the only one. So I helped them set that up, and then I ran operations there, uh, got got some of their scientific program going, and um, got them up and running. And uh, until recently, I was um, I was working on that, and then I joined uh, with Sustanza, uh, like mm-hmm. you mentioned. So that's that's my current gig is is consulting and helping uh, cannabis growers all over the world, similar to what I did with you know with, with Flower and some of the other companies I worked with, is is to get um, to bring some of the kind of the modern uh, modern horticultural practices and experience working with, um, with legacy growers to, uh, to growers everywhere, you know, at every right. scale and, and um, kind of help people produce cannabis at scale and, and make the crop kind of more standardized across the board. Absolutely. And I'm sure you came across some pretty incredible research while you were out there. Yeah. Is that published yet or is that still kind of <laughs> getting peer reviewed or... How, yeah, yeah, so how does that work? It's a good question. So as part of my, my graduate work, um, I have a bunch of publications and uh, I've done some since, but um, the cannabis industry is very known for its secrecy. So any of the, yep. the work I've done at private organizations has not been uh, made public. Um, so learned a lot. I uh, can't share, can't share uh, most of it, <laughs> but um, it's still, uh, at least it helps me become a better grower and I can share some of those experiences with, with, uh, with our clients. Yeah, totally. So nowadays you're at Sustanza Global, and uh, for the audience base, um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, your consulting team? Yeah, for sure. So um, we're a group of horticultural professionals, kind of similar to myself, um, experience in other crops, growing crops at scale, uh, high value crops, uh, very dialed into uh, kind of automation and, and operational efficiency and uh, understanding how plants fit into complex systems. Um, we draw on, on modern horticultural practices that we've learned um, in the legacy cannabis market, because you know, to, to get to where we are today, we had to kind of start from the ground up in cannabis and, and sure. learn about this crop, just like we've done with every other crop. Um, and so we spent a lot of time in cannabis, more than any other crop, I could say, confidently. Um, 
And, and, and so with all that knowledge, we, we help growers to create, uh, to, we help growers to create scalable, uh, high yielding and profitable facilities. That's kind of our main goal. And, uh, it's a good we, goal. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's important and there's a lot of yeah. value in it. Um, so we've supported some of the world's largest and most advanced producers and we still do, uh, indoor facilities up to 20, 250,000 square feet. Uh, greenhouses up to 25 acres, field sites wow. up to 160 acres. So a lot of, between the three of us, we have a pretty, pretty wide breadth of experience. We've had a lot of interest from the Canacrib side, Growers House, Growers Network, um, for us to offer consulting services. So mm-hmm. it's pretty cool that now we can uh, share with the world uh, your knowledge and your team as we're partnering together. Um, so Philip, everything that you learned, uh, the audience learned in canopy management. Now you can hire Philip. And now, uh, today we're really going to dive into post harvest with yourself, um, which kind of leads me, uh, into the book, uh, that both you, Philip is one contributing to that book as well. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So it's the handbook of cannabis production in controlled environments, and you're contributing to the chapter on post harvest. Um, so would love to dive into that and really for anyone tuning in today, um, this interview, uh, should have you walking away with learning something, uh, new, uh, when it comes to post harvest. So trimming, curing, drying, etc. Um, so just diving into the book here, uh, the yeah. chapter opens up with a warning about ineffective post harvest mm-hmm. procedures. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Sure. Let, let me just get into the, uh, the book a little bit, uh, if you yeah, don't mind. Totally. Uh, so, like you said, Handbook for Cannabis Production in Controlled Environments, and it's scheduled for publication uh, in June of this year, so fairly fairly shortly. I've been, been working on it for quite a while. Juan, Philip, and I contributed to both those chapters, uh, Canopy Management and Post Harvest, and uh, it was nice to kind of dig deep into a subject and on the research side and the practical side. It was a really good experience. Uh, basically, the, the, the book itself is, is unique. It's really cool, I think, because it's um, basically a group of top scientists uh, – that have been studying cannabis cultivation the past you know, five, six years since legalization in Canada, mostly. Um, and they got together with experienced operators to create effectively a comprehensive guide for, for new and experienced growers. So it's, it's unique that it draws on both the research, uh, but it also combines some practical experience from the most experienced scale cannabis growers. Because if you were to focus just on the research, there is you know, there's not much content. There's not that much research. Uh, you know, it's still it's still coming out. Um, it's only people have only been able to do this for just a little bit, a little bit of time. Uh, so to get you know to fill it up with, with solid content, it's basically um, cannabis research and then uh, practical experience that has been vetted by by scale horticulturalists that understand crops in general, uh, things that just kind of make sense or that you know there's parallels between other crops and together it's just a really comprehensive. Uh, useful guide, I think, for growers. So I'm very excited for when it comes out. Yeah, and we did not dive into that with Philip, so I appreciate you giving us a background on that. Um, sure. We will, uh, of course, we'll be launching this interview before the book is out. So whenever the book is ready uh, for purchase, uh, we'll link it in the description for anyone watching, um, and we'll we'll link it on our website as well. That'd be great. Yeah. So just diving in, I think that was one of the the biggest things uh, starting off the chapter was just kind of going into uh, ineffective post-harvest procedures. And mm-hmm. um, it's about time someone writes a book on it. So uh, where where can we start when it comes to that? Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a pretty deep subject, but I think it's pretty well known by most producers that, that, that growing and creating a high quality cannabis product goes so far beyond cultivation. Uh, the post-harvest process is as much an art as a science, but um, it's incredibly important. And it's very challenging uh, as an operator to have an effective post-harvest practice, again, because there's so little research in the area. And you have to draw on your experience, on you know learning from other people who have been doing it similarly, but often it hasn't been repeated. or uh, It's just overall, it's a challenge. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think to start, I'm just going to touch on probably one of the most common problems and you know if, if there's one thing that the audience can draw from today I guess it's probably this um, so this is what we see most commonly as, a, as an issue in the post harvest process and that's drying too quickly and storing your product for too long so for smokable flour uh, the target moisture content is about 8 to 13 percent that ranges based on preference and, and some other parameters but um, how do you get 
to that moisture content will vastly affect the quality of your product. So it's not just about getting to that range, it's about how you get there. So if you're drying your product too quickly, it can lead to fragile, crumbly buds um, that when you smoke them, it's harsh and um, it's just not a pleasant experience. But if you dry too slowly, uh, sorry, too, yeah, if you dry too slowly, so the, the buds are wet for too long during the drying mm -hmm. process, you increase the risk of spoilage. So I think that's pretty uh, easy to understand concept. But trying to figure out the balance between drying too quickly and too slowly is really the tricky bit. Uh, trying too quickly also leads to terpene loss, which, as uh, we all know, as, as cannabis growers, you know, cannabinoids are really important, but terpenes are so important for the user experience, for uh, for the aromas, for the smells, for the entourage effect. They're incredibly important compounds. So the idea is to dry slowly, um, but not too slowly. <laughs> so uh, I'll cite some research on this that I think is uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and it was done actually in the 70s. Again, not much research <laughs> in this area, but um, the University of Mississippi did some really cool work on this. Uh, and basically they found that cannabis buds that were stored at uh, 99 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 Celsius, uh, they only had a marginal cannabinoid loss, so just a bit of there's THC in most of they were measuring, but CBD as well, uh, just a little bit of cannabinoid loss over 24 hours. And they only saw the THC or, or CBD go down when the temperature went up all the way to 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 wow. C. So THC and, and, and CBD are fairly stable with temperature. Um, and usually it's, you know, you're increasing temperature to increase, to, to speed up dry. So you don't really have to worry too much about cannabinoids. Uh, and those temperatures far exceed what's used in traditional air drying techniques, what, what most growers are using. But on the other hand, if you look at terpenes, uh, terpenes are easily volatilized or evaporated uh, under just kind of moderately warm and dry conditions. So in the same study, they, they, they applied um, a range, just range of temperatures from minus 112 Fahrenheit to 77 Fahrenheit or minus 80 to 25 C. So they covered the whole gamut of, you know, it is flash frozen all the way mm -hmm. up to kind of ambient conditions. Um, and they found kind of regardless of how you, like what temperature you use, um, you were losing about 50% of your terpene content after four months. And that was higher with higher temperatures. So to think that it doesn't matter how good you're storing or drying your product, mm -hmm. um, you're probably going to be losing about 50% of your terpene content after four months. And, and I, I know many growers are, are storing their product in their vaults or in their safes and, uh, and then selling it. Or, you know, people kind of keep it and they cure it for a really long time. Uh, and that might have advantages for some, like maybe for smooth, like smoothness of the smoke or things like that. But if you're after terpenes, uh, which I know most growers are, drying too quickly and storing for too long are seriously, uh, seriously going to hamper hamper your, your, your efforts. Wow. And it all comes down to four months. That's the magic number. That's what they did in the study. Obviously there's, there's more work to do. 50 but, years later and different yeah. cultivars and, uh, better tools. I, I could see that changing or is it still the same you think? I, you know what, the, the, the terpenes aren't going to change. You know, I'm not sure how it'll change if the maximum terpene content is higher. Like in this, in the seventies, the terpene content was probably very low in these buds. And but, it was in Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Government, government cannabis too. So yeah, it's hard to say, but I, I do know. And this is, you know, this is the research that I can talk about because it's public. But you know, obviously, we've done work in this with growers, and terpene loss is overall a problem that we see all the time. And generally, the recommendation is get your product out there as soon as you cured. Uh, you finish curing. Um, we can talk. We'll talk about that later. And uh, don't try too quickly. So you know, we'll talk about how to keep keep uh mitigate the risk of spoilage during drying but try and kind of extend it as long as you can um so you don't lose terpenes and uh and then get your product out as soon as it's ready yeah and do you see any best practices for some of these ARP operators that you're working with as far as what they're storing in uh in terms of uh, oh in terms of containers it's not too um it, it's a we can talk about long-term storage a little bit let me let me pull up um my notes here on long-term storage. So basically during storage, the, the chemistry uh, within the cannabis flowers changes slowly. Like I said, THC and cannabinoids aren't changing too much, but the terpenes are, are, are um, decreasing quickly. 
And um, you also see physical changes in the buds, so like changes in colors and textures, and, mm -hmm. and the buds will dry, obviously, unless you're adding moisture uh, in the container. So uh, for practical purposes, uh, the most important things for storage is to keep the cannabis away from light, uh, from oxygen, and from warm temperatures. So the optimal that we've seen, you can go, it can be higher than this, you know, between um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit and ambient temperature is mm -hmm. generally okay. That'll slow the deterioration process, but... I say slow, it's, you're still going to have that terpene loss regardless. Um, and the two things that will, because if you just focus on terpenes, because that's kind of where your terpenes and moisture really are, are going to be the two main um, issues when you're storing. Um, to preserve both, uh, you want to use an airtight container, and that also helps with oxygen, and, and a food-safe container. You don't have to get too, it doesn't have to be stainless steel or anything like that. Um, okay. We've used you know double bags in, in, in storage, in, in totes, um, there's lots of fancy stuff out there that works great. Like, you know, you can use stainless steel. That's great. It's, it's food safe. It's, um, it's not going to uh, emit any like, odors or anything like that. You also want to avoid VOCs and plastics, things like that. You don't want your buds to end up smelling like a container. But there's lots of materials out there that work uh, quite well. Mylar bags work nicely. Um, and, yeah, again, try not to <laughs> store it for more than four months. Yeah, that seems like the the magic number there. And I know we'll we'll get into that a little bit more as far as uh, your best practices for actually storing. But let's start all the way at the beginning. Uh, yep. You're chopping down a room. So we get a lot of questions in both the Growers Network Forum um, and in the comment section on our YouTube channel. So time of harvest, mm -hmm. um, when, when do you think is the best time to harvest? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it's so it's so challenging. This is another this is another aspect that needs more <laughs> needs so much more research. But for sure, uh, there's a lot of ways to decide when to harvest your crops for a grower. So lots of growers look at the the trichome head color, okay, uh, or they schedule harvest based on a certain flowering duration. Uh, sadly, the the relationship between trichome color and cannabinoid or terpene content uh, is still poorly understood. There's not really any solid research on that. Um, and I haven't really seen much kind of R&D on that subject. That's that's really proven to me that, you know, this color means it's at its right kind of thing. Um, it's not that the method doesn't work. It just needs to be validated across different environments and cultivars. Uh, and so that work just needs to be done. And then growers will have a, a reliable tool for, for deciding on harvest timing. Um, until then, what we typically recommend for commercial growers is to take a series of bud samples uh, for analytical testing near the end of the flowering stage, uh, basically every week or you know if you can every few days, to figure out at what point the crop uh, reaches its highest levels of THC, CBD, terpenes, or whatever you're looking for, uh, and to use that information along with the the um, physical structure of the bud. So like if your THC, for example, is at a maximum, but you you know that your buds, if you give them a week, they're going to harden up and they'll be a more desirable product. Then you have to balance those two things, right? Right. Um, and that's that's a common issue, actually. Uh, so in, in practicing this whole thing of a serial sampling with different crops, you know, dozens of crops, do dozens of environments, we've, we've actually found huge variability between between the even within individual cultivars in different environments, or not d definitely between different um, cultivars. And the results don't seem to always be consistent with trichome color, uh, which you know there's there is some correlation, like the, it's it's rough. But um, it's not a step and not perfect. But kind of for home growers and for small scale growers who don't have access to the analytical testing, uh, if you go by the trichome color, um, and breeder recommendations are often good because the breeder could do these this sampling and then pass that information mm -hmm. on to you. So I definitely recommend to breeders to, to be doing this and give instead of just giving like an estimated THC content or cannabinoid content. That's a great point. To give a, a curve, you know, based on flower and time that's really important. I know some breeders are doing that now. Um, so yeah, the recommendation is to is to work with trichome color. So ge generally, we say that when trichomes appear milky in color, most of the trichomes, and you have to sample or take a look at buds uh, with a loop, for example, in different sections of the of the plant, uh, then the, the crop's ready to come down. Okay. And do you have any tools um, that you recommend growers use for that analytical testing? Uh, that's a good question. We've been, there's a lot of uh, newer kind of rapid, um, rapid T or THC CBD testing equipment, uh, and we we've played with a lot. Some of them really have not worked out for us. Um, 
We'll, we, we won't mention them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but we found actually pretty good results with one called Purple Pro, the Purple Pro. Um, okay. And it's, yeah, so it, the, the, the tricky bit is you're, you're, you can only uh, measure cannabinoids on dry samples. So you'd have to you take the sample from the fresh plant, dry it, and then, and then run it through either HPLC or, or if you have something, um, I think it runs on near-infrared technology. So there's different... Uh, piece of equipment that that use that technology, but the Purple Pro is yeah. one of them. Um, yeah, so you can you can do that serial sampling yourself. The equipment's still not cheap. You know, you're looking at at least a thousand US dollars even for a, a near infrared model. But um, it is you know an invaluable tool for growers trying to to produce a consistent crop. Right. So. For the growers that are maybe at home, you know, uh, rocking three or four lights, um, mm -hmm. what's your what's your best recommendation for them as far as uh, when to uh, harvest? Yeah, I think it goes back to breeder recommendations. Uh, okay. So, you know, if a breeder has grown their crop indoors under somewhat reasonable settings, uh, you could probably bank on their flowering time that they recommend. Okay. And that in combination with the trichome color, looking for milky trichomes uh, on most of the plant. Uh, that's a fairly good tool. And, you know, there's also, there's other things. Like sometimes you need to harvest because, you know, if you leave it too long, you're going to risk bud rot and things like that. So yeah, there, there's, uh, there's all sorts of different factors that play into it, but uh, those are the two that I would, Excellent. Are, are the best tools. Yeah. yeah. And in your chapter um, on post-harvest, you were talking about some of the different factors that influence the overall uh, maturing time. Mm -hmm. um, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So that's a deep, that's a deep subject, and that there's a lot of research on that with other crops. Um, very little on cannabis, but generally, uh, it's, I think it's pretty under, well understood by a lot of growers that genetics plays a huge role in, in, in maturation rates. So there's some varieties that will take you know weeks longer than others to mature. Uh, temperature plays a role. So you know, the warmer the temperature, the faster the plants will grow. Generally, the faster they'll reach maturation. Light intensity is a big one. Um, with more light intensity to all of these things are to a certain cap, but you know, mm -hmm. generally with higher light intensity, you're going to have faster growth rates, possibly faster times of maturation. And then there's the whole world of, of plant stressors, which like I mentioned, I did some, some of that work in my, in, uh, in grad school. Um, and that's a tricky one, still very poorly understand, understood, but there are some stressors that might, you know, increase maturation rates or increase certain levels of, of secondary metabolites like cannabis and terpenes, things like that. Let's let's dive a little bit deeper on that controlled stress uh, part there. So, what would you say is one of the most common ways uh, to control that? Um, yeah. And maybe for at scale for some of the you know commercial audience listening, um, what could be implemented um, in a larger facility than you know in comparison at home. Mm -hmm. Because uh, yeah. there's, we have uh, both both types of growers in our community, and mm -hmm. um, sometimes we might have an interview or an episode that might be telling you how to do something uh, that's not applicable to uh, to both sides. Yeah, yeah, that, and that, this is actually one area where there is a big difference between commercial and home growers, and the home growers actually might have an advantage here. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it to to apply controlled stress at scale is near impossible unless you're using some kind of like plant growth regulator, which we don't. We don't tend to use in cannabis. Don't use PGRs. <laughs> no. Um, so, well, what I studied specifically was was the effects of drought stress on uh, on uh, match on basically cannabinoid content um, in THC cannabis, but there's also CBD. It's like a THC CBD cultivar, so we got to look at both. Um, so we did find that we were able to increase THC content and I think CBD content too. I have to pull the paper again; it's been a while. Uh, by applying controlled a controlled drought stress once during the flowering stage. Basically what that meant was uh, the plants were in, I think, three gallon pots and we let the, we let the plants uh, go to wilting point, which we measured using a protractor, like the leaf angle. So mm -hmm. once the plants leaf, um, the leaves wilt at a certain point, um, that in combination with a lot of <laughs> high tech equipment, we were measuring like the, the water potential in the plant using in situ stem psychrometers and, and we looked at the moisture content of the substrate and the photosynthetic rate of the leaves and all sorts of stuff to, to basically we had to do those things because it's very easy to overdo it and if you overdo it it's it's uh, if you overdo it you're going to lose yield uh, like no question I mean, everyone knows i think if you drought stress your plants too often your yield is going to suffer um but it's possible that if you do it once or twice just the right amount you might have a slight increase in thc cbd 
Mm-hmm. And so that's why I say for commercial growers, imagine trying to, to grow a room uh, of cannabis and, and waiting for all of them to get to that exact amount of stress. That's not too much, but, you know, just it's enough. Impossible. It's impossible. It's nearly possible. Uh, you know, I've, I've never suggested that to a commercial grower, but at home, like, I'll play around with it because, you know, if you have four plants or, or whatever number of plants you have, um, you can stand there and wait, you know, it's, it's a <laughs> hobby. So um, I've done that and, you know, there you can have good results. Uh, so, yeah, if you're a home grower, you can play with that stuff. Just go. I, I suggest reading that publication, I think, it, especially if you're a home grower because you can, you can readily apply some of that work. Yeah, and we'll link every single thing that we uh, reference in here. Um, and of course, once the book is out as well. Um, but uh, I loved uh, just including all the resources for people to, to continue their education. Sure. Um, so Darren, we're going to take our first break. And, and when we get back, uh, we're going to talk about all the wonderful things about trimming. Nice. Okay. See you then. Let's talk about automation from Green Bros. The first up is the endline system, which automates the two highest plant touching points of your post harvest process trimming and sorting. Every piece of the system was designed to preserve the quality of cannabis flower while processing pounds as fast as possible. It's minimal drop points, no vibration operation, and patented trichome safe blades ensure your flower comes out of the system looking pristine. Green Bros, American made, industry born. All right, Darren, uh, we are back from break. Uh, we were talking about all the delicious food in uh, Guadalajara, uh, where I live. <laughs> uh, so let's let's dive into trimming. Um, so from your experience in both consulting and, and your background, like academic background, um, what what are your thoughts around bucking? Because uh, some grow operations that we go to film uh, implement uh, a bucking process and some don't. So can you set the record straight today? Sure, yeah. It's not, not too sexy in this type of subject. But, um, <laughs> so normally, normally you're bucking either before dry trimming. So you've, you've hung dry your plants. They need to be bucked before. Or you can, you can trim them on the, on the branches as well, but some people will buck them before trimming. Or um, you're bucking before rack, uh, rack drying. So you, you'll buck and then wet trim and then rack dry. Um, for, for a commercial grower, if you're, um, you know, it helps... Bucking helps in a, in a number of ways. Like, typically, you're going to either buck by hand or you're going to use a bucking machine. Um, uh, it helps, you know, increase consistency in your buds. You know, if you're bucking by hand, there's going to be differences between the people, but the machine is typically more consistent. But it increases the speed at which you can uh, break the buds away from the branches. And the, and the bucking machines kind of work by pulling, sucking effectively branches through a hole of metal plate using powered rollers, and mm-hmm. then it shears off the inflorescences, the buds from the stem. Okay. But, but yeah, I like it. Nothing against bucking. <laughs> yeah, and and would you say um, it really just depends on the scale and and the volume of biomass you're trying to get through? Because the first time I uh, really was introduced to the subject, I think it was episode four at Los Sueños Farms. Mm-hmm. Um, they were using. We can cue the the B roll uh, note to editor, but they were using. I believe it was called the Mother Bucker. It was yeah, probably one so. of the coolest names ever yeah. for a hydro product. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were getting through a lot. Uh, I think it was like thirty six acres or something like that, and thirty six thousand plants. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I've seen uh, I've seen it both ways, and um, I guess it just comes down to uh, you know how much you're trying to get through. Um, yeah, it's kind of like I can see why some growers might not want to use it. I think it kind of falls in line with so some growers want to use as little <clears throat> mechanization as possible, and more of kind of like a hand a hand trimmed hand met like oh yeah all processed by hand. Right, and you know it's 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 a marketing thing, and it's also just like a, an ethos for certain companies. Nothing against that either. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm not going to let you get off that easily. So hand trimming versus machine trimming, probably mm-hmm. one of the biggest debates um, that has ever crossed the Canna Cribs community. Um, there are so many growers that are adamant about both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and honestly, kind of to what you just said, it, it is a preference at the end of the day. Um, I've seen, I think, uh, King's Garden is probably one of the largest trim rooms I've ever seen. It was like a cafeteria of like 50 to 70 people hand mm. trimming. Um, but I've also seen, um, you know, smaller scale facilities get through the same amount of weight uh, by using some type of uh, trimming uh, system. So yeah. what what's your, what's your preference if you're going to a facility, let's say 
10,000 square feet um, that they're trying to get through of canopy to, you know, something closer to one of the big dogs up in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of considerations with, with deciding whether you're going to hand trim or machine trim. The, first off, the machine trimming technology has come such a long way in the past five years, I would say, that models that, you know, when I started graduate work were pretty rough. Um, and now, you know, I'm seeing results that are pretty cool. Like, they're not the same as hand trimming, but they're pretty close. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, differences in, like, the trimming um, in, the, in the machine trimming technology. End of the day, it, you're not going to get the same quality as hand trimming, at least right now. Um, okay. But the, unless you have an unlimited supply of cheap labor, it is such a, it adds so much to your, your cost per gram to, uh, to hand trim compared to machine trim. Um, like in Canada, you know, if your labor is not, it, you know, it's quite expensive. Um, we all help and like, it's just expensive. Um, and yeah. it's very hard to justify hand trimming. And I think it's more of a, in the end for the consumer, some consumers might like it. And I'm sure there are consumers that like it, that, that, that prefer that, but it's really an aesthetic thing. You're not going to, there's not going to be like much of a noticeable difference mm. in the, in the, in the, uh, in the effect of the product, um, or the smell really like they, they say that maybe mechanized trimming is more rough on the product, but I don't really buy that. Like as the tech, the technology, the way it is now, I think it's, Similar, if not better, in terms of like losing trichomes as you trim, uh, because you know people managing it and tossing it in buckets and you know, um, it's yeah, that's there's also some damage. level of yeah. damage there as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was just gonna ask, just kind of like follow on to that, Darren. So, um, if you were uh, consulting with the project and they're just gonna pass it all through to processing regardless, machine trim. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would just, um, I would definitely suggest machine, machine trimming unless they have some kind of marketing aspect that they really want to, they really want to have hand trimmed, or they have, okay. yeah, um, so some other reason. But you know, hooking them up with a, with a good, with a good post harvest company that can that can produce a product that's consistent and you know, it's very, it's it, it takes away from from my work in terms of helping them get to the yield and the quality of, of the, of the bud. And then, um, making sure that, that the trim process is good is, you know, equally as important like, unless mm -hmm. you trim properly, uh, it, it, you're not going to be able to, uh, produce a quality product. And then it's also going to add a huge cost to your hand trimming. And then it doesn't matter how right. much you save on the cultivation, you're going you're gonna to pay for it on the hand trim. Yeah. You're just going to tack that on, on at the, uh, the end. And, yeah. Um, I have seen um, more and more over the past five years of filming a lot of facilities adopting almost like a hybrid model um, yeah. where if yeah. they have a bud, so to speak, it's not a, a drop in quality. But again, you're paying a little bit more for that aesthetic, as you put it. Yeah. Uh, maybe that is a pure hand trim line. Uh, maybe the, the B's and C's. Again, you're just paying for a more manicured machine trimmed bud. You're not getting so much uh you know loss in quality of your smoke um and yeah. then of course the processing department um i haven't seen too many brands go for the hand trimmed you know fresh frozen oil i mean they they're out there um but i just haven't seen as a, as a trend quite yet yeah yeah hand trimming for for extraction that to me i don't i can't i can't see a, a valid reason for that yeah I, better be caviar yeah. quality <laughs> yeah um yeah, I, I've seen a lot of Canadian producers. Like, I haven't uh, seen this too much in the U.S. just because I haven't uh, been exposed as deeply in the U.S. market. But uh, they're doing, yeah, like the hybrid process that like you say. But instead of doing some product by hand, it's more they'll do like a hand finishing step. So they'll machine trim, and then they'll have a, uh, a line to, to basically just finish up some of the buds mm -hmm. to uh, to give it that more hand, uh, hand trim look. And it is effectively hand trimmed you know, part, part of the way. Uh, so the market is this little hand finished or, or something yeah. like that. But it's not really hand trim, but yeah. it does make the product look a little nicer in the end, the end of the day. Designed in California, manufactured in China. There you go, yeah. <laughs> so it's great to have an expert on, on our show uh, today. And I've, I've heard this question and debate uh, again 
countless times. Uh, wet trim versus dry trim. Uh, when would you do either of those? Um, and mm-hmm. what's your, your preference to a commercial and then also, let's say, a hobbyist grower? Yeah, okay. So um, this is also really a really uh, difficult topic. So we've seen good results with both methods. Let's say that first off. Um, but there's a few key, key considerations you can talk through. I won't say one is better than the other, but um, so the first one is the speed of the harvest. Uh, this is more more important for commercial growers. Uh, mm-hmm. So when you're dry trimming, all the plants from a crop can be quickly harvested and they, they're hung immediately, brought into the, uh, into the drying room um, and, till, and they dry dried until they're ready for trimming. So that's nice because you are effectively emptying your flowering room in a day or a half a day, right? Which um, Efficiency's sake. Mm-hmm. You can clean it the, the other half of the day and then you get the next crop in it the day after. So y- your number of crops per year in that room mm. might increase because of that capability. With, with wet trimming, you can do the same thing, but the plants need to be trimmed right after harvest. You don't want plants to be sitting wet after their harvest for more than a couple hours. So you want to be harvesting them. Uh, let's, for commercial sake, let's say they're going through a wet trimmer and after they go through the wet trimmer, they go onto racks and they're in the drying room, right? So you have to make sure that your uh, wet trimming process can handle um, all of that, uh, all of that material. Let's say in a day or in a half day. A day is probably more realistic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you are, but if you're dry trimming, you can take this, take the product out of the dry room periodically and have less less capacity in your trimming setup than you would if you're wet trimming. Um, so. It, it's a matter of scheduling, and it's also a matter of how much infrastructure you need for trimming. So if you're wet trimming, you might need more infrastructure than dry trimming. Okay. So, yeah. And growing at home for, you know, kind of uh, people getting yeah, through yeah. their first harvest, what what would you say there? Yeah, so let me talk about these two other points, and I think it'll... Um, totally. It, yeah. Uh, so the, the next one is trichome preservation. Uh, mm-hmm. So this th- this is something that... Obviously, we'll, we'll apply to home growers as well. But um, when you're trimming, uh, trichomes will separate more easily from a plant when the water content's low. So if it's drier, and you, let's say you're tumble drying, mm-hmm. uh, and you put uh, dry material through a tumble dryer or a wet material, you're more likely to lose trichome heads if the product's dry. Uh, so since trichomes are more prone to separating from dry material, uh, wet trimming likely has the advantage of better preserving trichomes in the final product. So from that perspective, it might be nice to wet trim. Okay. Um, and for a home grower as well, we don't have to worry about the first point I mentioned. Um, yeah, it's nice. Uh, and the last point is the risk of spoilage. So this is a kind of uh, interesting one, I think. Um, and there's also kind of in doing this digging for this paper, we found, uh, for this textbook, we found this. But uh, so interestingly, more mold um has been found in, in wet trim buds compared to ones that are untrimmed. So that basically, some researchers have found that the trimming process when you're wet trimming, um, this is some research from 2019 um, out of Samir Poonja's lab in, uh, in Saskatchewan, um, they found that there'd be more mold on wet trimmed bud than if you weren't trimming. So the trimming process when wet increases the risk of spoilage. So that's a downside for wet trimming. But um, <laughs> so it's kind of like back and forth. Mm-hmm. I think it comes down to preference. The, the the last thing, which is the which is the benefit for home growers, is that when you're hang drying plants, uh, if the plant is kind of whole with some of the leaves attached, uh, then it slows down the drying process. And so, if if you don't have a completely controlled environment, let's say that you can't perfectly control your temperature and humidity, then uh, like I talked about the, the very first thing we mentioned was was slow drying, right? Um, and to slow down the drying process, having a whole plant's helpful uh, because the moisture from the leaves and the stems are slowly kind of homogenizing with the buds and it just overall slows down and protects the, the buds, the inflorescences uh, as they dry. So it, it, it acts as an extra tool for slowing down the drying process. And then you can also try and uh, keep your environment consistent. So from that perspective, I typically recommend hang drying for home growers because okay. it just, it means that they're less likely to over dry their, their product. Right. So it has a little bit more bumper lanes on it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that's a big reason why a lot of large scale producers are still uh, dry tripping because from that, that mentality of product, I think throughout, throughout, you know, uh, the illicit market for a long time, it was always that hang, the dry trim canvas that was better. 
Um, and I think it's because that that product had a slow, on average, had a slower drying period. Mm. Um, and then it was associated with a higher quality product. But I don't think that that holds up anymore. Uh, That's given the ability to control the environment in the drying room like, to a T that most, the way that most commercial growers can do that. Yeah, absolutely. And just diving in a little bit more about dry trimming, um, you're talking about spoilage. So how can mm. a grower uh, mitigate spoilage throughout the drying process? Yeah. Okay. So I'll talk about spoilage from the whole post-harvest perspective. Um, uh-huh. So like I said before, the balance is to is to uh, preserve the integ- physical integrity of the bud, the chemical integrity of the bud, and then prevent spoilage. So the key to preventing spoilage is to lower the, wa- the, the water content of fresh cannabis uh, to a point where bacteria and fungi can't grow and reproduce in it. Uh, so each microorganism has different requirements for available water in, in any product, whether it's food or cannabis, uh, for them to be able to grow and, and, and reproduce. And, and to measure that, um, that ability for them to grow, uh, we use a concept called uh, water activity, mm. AW for short. Okay. Um, so this is used in food, uh, like in food safety labs and, and in general for a lot of things. This is the reason why, you know, dry foods stay fresh longer than fresh foods. Okay. Um, so the, the water activity typically ranges, well, it ranges from zero to one. Um, and uh, basically one is like the most moisture content available for microbial growth and one is none. Um, and for cannabis, there's been some research on this, which thank God, um, the, the risk of spoilage is very low when the water activity gets below 0.65. Uh, and that you can correlate that with moisture content. So when moisture content is around 14%, uh, or lower, then you're pretty safe for dry flower. Okay. Um, so getting the moisture content down to 14% or lower or a water activity of 0.65 or lower is kind of key for, for preventing spoilage. Uh, and to measure to measure either of those numbers, you, for water activity, you can, you can get a water activity meter, which is yeah. a good tool for commercial growers, but they can be pretty expensive. Um, and you can also measure moisture content, and home growers can do that as well. Um, but kind of all in all, like there's 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 ways of kind of knowing if your bud's at fourteen percent, like the ste- stem snapping method. When it gets to it, small stems, snap cleanly. That typically you're you're like in a safe zone, so it's not it's not usually too much of an issue. Um, just kind of looking at that trichome color, like uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, just something that's been passed down from generation of generation mm-hmm. to growers. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and it actually works quite well. Like it's uh, that's actually something that um, like I'll do cereal. Again, I suggest cereal moisture sampling or water activity sampling for commercial growers. And uh, we go in there when the crop's ready, when it hits that threshold they want, you snap the stems, and it's, it's usually pretty pretty tight with um, with the values that we're looking for. So that's actually a good method for home growers, I think. Totally. Um, so, again, so you're trying to, to get to these, these like desired water activity, moisture, moisture content thresholds, but you want to do it as slowly as possible, uh, again, to preserve terpenes. Uh, and so you don't get a crumbly, harsh-smoking dry flower. Uh, but um, if you do it too slowly, then the maybe the water activity is going to be too high for too long, and then you you have a higher risk of spoiler. So balancing it. So, but typically, in terms of like recommendations, um, to get to that desired safe moisture content, mm-hmm. it, typically it, it's nice to try and get there in five to seven days. However, you want to do that, so you can. Um, the, the drying speed can be controlled by adjusting the the, um, the temperature or the humidity of the drying room, drying environment. Uh, and to increase drying speed, you raise the temperature uh, because higher temperature has more drying potential at a constant relative humidity. Uh, and then just keep in mind that the higher the temperature, the more terpene loss. So mm. it's, it's just trying it's to get spectrum. it the spectrum. Yeah. yeah, that balance. Mm-hmm. And airflow plays into it as well. I just want to have you know, good air circulation, so it's not kind of stagnant pockets of humid air. You want to avoid that. Mm-hmm. So, what are some other types of problems that might crop up in a poorly executed drying process? Um, and again, just something that maybe you've seen on a commercial scale, um, and then something maybe you've even seen, you know, in a home garden. Yeah. So, air circulation is a big one. 
Um, so it's, it's one thing to have a, a sensor in the middle of your room that's measuring and controlling your temperature and humidity. But if you are packing in your hang dried plants or your racks really tightly, and there's not enough air circulation in the room, and you were to put a, a data logger or mm-hmm. temperature or humidity probe in with the product, it'd be very different from what you're controlling. So it's really important to control to, just like you control to, like I'm sure Philip mentioned this, you control the room to the canopy of the plant. Um, yes. If that's the okay, that's your harvestable product. Uh, you're you're kind of controlling the room to the temperature and the, the environment around the, the drying product. That that's a big one, and that that's very you just have, have to have a good understanding of, of controlled environments and, and and how they work. Absolutely, and to air circulation. Um, if someone's watching this and has have not watched the canopy management episode with Philip, uh, he goes into that as well. Um, plays a, an extremely important part uh, throughout the life cycle of the plant. Um, so, how does this relate to really preserving the overall quality um, of your cannabis? So, in general, like I said before, like oh, in terms of air quality, you mean? I mean air, um, airflow. So not just air circulation, but just any of those problems that we were mentioning uh, that might come up in the drying process. Mm. Um, how do those impact uh, just really the and, and relate uh, to preserving the quality of your plant? Yeah, so it all comes back again to terpenes and spoilage, right? So if you if you have too too many high humidity pockets in your room, you're more likely to proliferate bud rot, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and that product is not usable, and it's, it, it, you know it's not sellable, and it's going to be it'll also spread to other products. So that's a big, a big issue. Uh, and, and if you're drying too quickly, you're going to have a lower terpene content product uh, that might be too dry. You don't want a product that's too dry because it's going to be harsh to smoke, and um, it's also lower weight. So you're, you know, when you sell the product, uh, you, you have a lower weight overall, and you're selling the product by weight, so you don't want to overdry. Um, so it comes down to yeah, terpenes and spoilage. Okay. And like we were mentioning that four months magic number, are there parameters in the drying process that you always try to strive for? Um, maybe you mentioned them here or there, but is there something that we could recap here for the listeners? Yeah. So again, trying to hit that desired moisture content uh, within five to seven days. Okay. Uh, every producer is going to have to play around with their own environment to, to get there. Um, but keeping it cool um, and uh, you know, 50 to 60 percent humidity is often like a pretty good starting point. But again, playing around with that uh, and doing serial moisture sampling or you know the snap test, uh, mm-hmm. so that the next time you grow, you know you'll, you'll hit that five to seven days. And uh, you, it, it's just kind of a bit of trial and error, but you can usually get it within one or two runs in a, in a dry room. Right. And can you explain, Darren, your ideal uh, drying room setup? Um, I've been to facilities that just load up a room. Um, to your point, air circulation could be a problem. Um, whereas other facilities, they, there might be you know, a lot of space between racks. Um, what's your, you know, what do you envision if you were brought in uh, today to go build out a drying room um, that people can bring back to their facility? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, a, a drying room that has a maximum amount of kind of low, like uniform but low airflow. So there's there's definitely air movement within within let's say it's hanging plant. So you have all your racks should be able to be side by side, uh, and you're hanging the plant so that they're not touching each other. So mm-hmm. there's always air between you know, every bud, uh, but the racks should be able to um, be beside each other so you can maximize space. And then having you know, perforated walls is really nice. It's a really nice way of, of pulling, bring air on one side and kind of out the other. It goes through the canopy that way at a very low uh, rate, so you're not over drying. Um, and then similarly for rack drying, you should be able to have all your racks tightly, like beside each other, but then you just space the racks so that you have airflow and you can measure the airflow with an airflow meter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Philip mentioned that. Uh, so just trying to. You know, you have your temperature, your environmental parameters, but then ensuring that once you've set everything up and, you know, and is as efficiently as possible in terms of space, then just going in and verifying that you're good with with the airflow meter uh, and either data loggers or, or little temperature humidity sensors to make sure that they're uniform throughout the room. Uh, one way that we, like, if we if we work with a grower that, that 
is having issues often, you know, if you can't just fix the room right away, but so randomizing the racks every once in a while, sometimes the ones that are closest to the air vents will dry faster. So moving them around is, is a good practice. Yeah, rotation. Yeah. So we're talking about all these different ways uh, to dry the plant. Um, what's the best way, in your opinion, Darren, to actually measure the moisture content? Are there any tools um, that you use on a regular basis? Yeah. Um, so moisture content is hugely important data uh, for the person managing the drying space. So uh, the simplest way to measure moisture content is using the loss on drying principle. Effectively, you're, you you take a sample and you heat it, or you take the mass first, the weight, and, mm-hmm. and you heat it to evaporate moisture until a point where the weight stabilizes, and then you weigh it again, and you're cons- consistently weighing it, and that way you know um, the difference between the dried weight and the fresh weight, and that gives you, through a quick calculation, you can figure out what the um, moisture, the original moisture content was of that sample. So that's the the, um, the simplest way. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get to even like a, a small commercial scale, using a bench top uh, bench top moisture analyzer is it's really useful and, and practical. Um, it, it operates on the same principle uh, okay. as loss, loss on drying, but it automatically will weigh and heat samples and give you a moisture content reading in just minutes. Um, uh-huh. And they're not overly expensive. There's there's pretty good uh, okay. there's pretty good products out there from Metric Toledo, from uh, Lico, from Sartorius. They all have quality products. So I, I would look into that if you don't have one as a grower. And you can also use um, water activity meters, like I said before, but those tend to be a little bit more expensive. And in the end of the day, when you're calculating um, the THC content or, or um, you're keeping data, it's nice to have the moisture content data regardless. Absolutely. And as far as methodologies of drying, uh, we talked a lot about hang drying. Um, are there any specific advantages or disadvantages to hang drying? Yeah. So um, like I mentioned before, so you know, faster room t- turnovers with hang drying. Um, with screen drying, you have potentially a more efficient use of space in the drying room because of the the racks um, that you know trays on racks. So you can potentially get more product in the smaller space. Um, yeah, that's kind of the main differences. Okay. Again, it, 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 they're different because they're 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 related to dry trimming and wet trimming, um, and so obviously they're connected with the advantages and disadvantages of those as well. Absolutely. And what about uh, whole plant drying versus cuttings? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Cause it's a good, it's a good um, thing to, to take away from, from the chat today. But basically, the stems and, and some of the leaves, um, when, you're, when you are hang drying, are still attached uh, to the plant. So it's, you've, got, you've got the whole plant, right? And the stems and the leaves will help slow down the drying process. Um, so theoretically, moisture is evaporating from the leaves and the buds at the same time. Uh, and while that's happening, more moisture is being pulled from the stem. So uh, as you start to as you start to break down the plant when you're drying, you get a little bit less of that advantage and it speeds mm-hmm. up the drying process. So if you're trying to slow down the drying process, it's really nice to have a little plant. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. And um, another huge topic um, that sometimes we even gloss over because at, at this point we filmed a lot of facilities and some of them don't really have a, a full-on built-out curing process um, mm-hmm. but we're we're going to take our final break here darren and when we get back i'd love to jump into drying versus curing and and if curing is necessary yeah for sure okay let's talk about some automation solutions from green bros the m plus automated trimmer this is Green Bros patented trichome safe blades combined with the automated feeding to make this the most hands-off trimmer they've ever produced. With the M Plus trimming system, you'll be able to trim over 30 pounds, 30 pounds of dried cannabis in one hour without sacrificing your bud's bag appeal. Thirdly is the rise and sort system from Green Bros. It eliminates contamination points, mitigates employee repetitive motion injuries, and can sort well over 300 pounds of dried cannabis in one hour. Overall, these solutions are gentle on the flower. They increase efficiency without sacrificing quality. They are built with future-proofed materials. All of these machines are constructed to inhibit microbial growth 
minimize the cleaning time and overall meet GMP requirements. It allows you to free up staff, providing more efficient systems, allowing you to skill up your employees and devote labor resources to other areas of your business. Green Bros, American made, industry born. We're back from our last break, Darren, and I'd love to really talk about drying versus curing and, and if curing is really necessary. Uh, so just kind of starting off with that, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one of the most interesting topics to dig into this chapter is definitely curing. I, 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 it's not something that I knew that much about because there's literally there's no research, uh, academic research in, on curing uh, for wow. cannabis. Um, but it's like, it's still a, a nearly universally uh, practiced uh, process by most producers of smokable flour. Yeah. So it's so on one hand there's very little information on it, and, and the other hand, you know, everyone's doing it. So it made it really interesting uh, to try and understand why, like it's obviously being done for a reason. Um, and so kind of what we found, uh, again, it's not proven, but it seems like the process is to improve the the smoothness and the taste of cannabis smoke. Um, to preserve the existing secondary metabolites, the cannabinoids, terpenes, and then also to normalize the moisture content within the bud so that the outside of the bud is the same moisture content as the inside of the bud um, and you just have a uniform product. And again, I could say confidently that there's pretty much no academic research in, in the area. So everything we know now is based on experience and then also parallels to other crops like tobacco, which is also good. Right. And there's not a whole lot of research to pull from. Um, do you have a process of what makes a good cure versus a bad curing process? Yeah, well, let me, let, let's talk about this, this other little subject here because again, it's like, yeah. you know, do you need to cure or not? Is it was your first question, and, and that's even a tricky question. So, hmm. uh, so, so how, like, the, the idea behind how curing can increase the quality of the, the cannabis smoke and the smoothness. Um, it's thought to be based on like the enzymatic breakdown of chlorophyll and starches in, in the bud uh, into sugars. So okay. it's, it's turning kind of the leafy uh, complex sugar, leafy uh, chlorophyll and, and, and complex sugars into more simple sugars. Um, and at, at least like that, that's the case with uh, the tobacco. Again, there's not been any research on what's under what's what chemical processes are happening to cannabis during curing, but on tobacco, that's how, how it works. So it's breaking mm -hmm. down some of the chlorophyll and the starches into sugars. Um, and for tobacco, it's been proven to, to create a more, um, like a more pleasant smoke. And, and the smoke uh, between tobacco and cannabis actually shares a lot of cynical, uh, similar uh, physical and, and chemical properties. Uh, one really interesting difference between the processes of curing uh, cannabis versus curing tobacco is that for tobacco, uh, curing occurs before the drying, but for cannabis, mm -hmm. it typically occurs afterwards. Right. Uh, so for for, um, for tobacco, it, it's cured when it's still fresh because uh, enzymatic breakdown of, of these products occurs more efficiently when the moisture content is high. Uh, and it, this really made me think about you know the role of curing in cannabis and when is curing which I'm, I'm defining as the breakdown of, of chlorophyll and, and starches, when is it actually happening um, in, in the post-harvest process? And it's making me think that most of that enzymatic breakdown is probably happening during the slow drying process, hmm. uh, and that the curing step is mostly for normalizing the moisture content. And I, I might be completely wrong here. Like I'm, I'm hoping that research comes out or some, you know, some uh, growers or processors put out a white paper to, to, to prove or disprove me, but this is my thinking now. Um, so I, I think it's it, it's maybe more emphasis should be put on the slow drying process um, because that's possibly when you know the bulk of the work is happening from the from the enzymes. And I think it's it's fair to say that expert processors um, will often mention a slow drying process being just as important as a long curing time. So usually they come together. Like you're, they, you know you have to have a slow dry, and then you have to have a long cure, and I can see why that's the case. Uh, because if you if you have um, a slow dry, then potentially you're going to have a smoother product and, and uh, you know more palatable product. And then the curing on the other end, 
that I'm not sure about. That I think you know you you don't need too long for the bud to homogenize. That can happen in you know a few days in a sealed container. Uh, we've proven that, but um, we would definitely need more research in the area. And so whether or not you growers should have a long curing stage or not, I wouldn't tell anyone to go change their process because we don't know enough. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm pretty confident that having a long drying period is more important than having a long curing period. Okay, so that's where and I'm at. If you were to kind of combine the research we were talking about earlier about the four months drying process and then diminishing returns after that point, um, what would you say combining that four months drying process with curing? What's that total time uh, with both of those things combined look yes. like? Um, so, sorry, it's it's a four-month storage process. So you wouldn't want to ah, store storage. your product for, for four months. So, you know, you could dry, if you can dry your product in, let's say, 10 days is like an optimal right. drying time because then it's a really slow process um, and you're having tons of enzymatic breakdown. And then you cure for, you know, five days or seven days just to get the, the blood homogenous. It's probably enough. Okay. Again, like I, I, can't be, I can't say I'm an expert on this because I don't have uh, the research to back me or I haven't done the research to um on that area specifically, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. Absolutely. So one last question on curing. Um, what's your recommended method for curing? Mm-hmm. So if we're focusing on just um, ensuring that the, the flower moisture content is homogenous, then um, a process of, of, of binning and, and uh, sweating works really nicely. So basically, you're, you, you know, you put... Um, a bunch of, of trimmed flour in a sealed container. Uh, let mm-hmm. it breathe every once in a while so that you're not getting buildups of, um, of moisture content of humid air. And then once your uh, your moisture content is consistent between buds, you should be good to go to seal it up and and uh, and store that or, or you know package it. Okay, and we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier as far as the actual storage process. Um, but there are everything from uh, vault style containers, uh, mylar bags. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've seen a lot of different, uh, you know, packaging options out there for for storage uh, in particular. And then also there are the uh, humidity packs um, mm-hmm. that have been added in. And yeah. I just I'd love to hear from you as the expert on this. Um, what's the best way uh, to store your flour um, all the way before you know pushing out to transit to like a, a dispensary partner? Yeah, it's um, a good question. So following general guidelines for preserving any dry product is, is, is typically a good approach. So you want to keep it away from direct light, uh, from oxygen, from warm temperatures. Uh, so some research, um, early research really, but it showed that around 40 degrees Fahrenheit is a good temperature for, for terpene preservation and you can go probably up to room temperature is fine. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't think it's best to, to freeze your product. You actually have more terpene loss that way. Um, and you can also have some physical deterioration. So kind of room temperature, like between fridge temperature and room temperature, uh, pretty good and uh, avoid oxygen, warm temperature and light. And then on the, on the topic of moisture, having a sealed container is really important. So this is completely airtight. Um, you want something that will not let, you know, humid or dry air in and will not let humid or dry air out. Um, the two-way humidity packs work really great for that, especially for home growers and for small-scale growers. Um, yeah. You, you know, you don't necessarily need them if you can uh, really effectively manage your, your process as a commercial grower. But... If you, uh, it makes the process easier, you know, it, it gives you some wiggle room, which I appreciate, especially when I'm growing at home, I use them. So mm-hmm. uh, I would recommend that. Uh, and then, yeah, not storing too long <laughs> is, the, is the best thing. Like, you know, the, Time. keep, keep growing. Um, don't, don't, uh, you know, it's interesting to try. If you, if you ever grown cannabis and, you know, you have a jar in your basement and you smoke it, um, after a year or, or so, try, try to remember what it, what it, tasted like right after you finished curing. It's like at night and day. Often it's pretty smooth when it's, if it's been stored with the right moisture content for a long time, but you lose so much flavor. Um, it might have a different chem- chemical profile in terms of cannabinoids. You might have some degradation of cannabinoids after that point. And, but uh, in terms of the taste and the, and the smell, it's going to be a whole different product. Right. And we talked about... Uh, 
all things post-harvest today. So the harvesting process, trimming, drying, curing, et cetera. Is there anything else, Darren, uh, when it comes to post-harvest that you'd like to impart with our uh, audience today? Well, there's a lot more to read uh, in detail in the textbook, so I, de- I definitely recommend picking that up when it's out. Um, I only kind of touched on some of the superficial stuff today. Um, a lot of it's pretty detailed, um, so maybe not super interesting to talk about over a podcast, but definitely interesting to read. So I would um, I would recommend reading more about the subject, and uh, to anyone who has the ability to do research in this area, please do it. Uh, help all of us, um, and I will try and do the same <laughs> in that area. That's great. And uh, if anyone is out there wants to hire uh, Sustanza Global and the now Canna Cribs Consulting team, what's the best way that they reach out to you? Yeah, so we are uh, available and happy to support growers in uh, work on design, on um, operations, so improving the, the efficiency of operations, um, improving the quality of product, inc- uh, reducing costs. Um and designing facilities from the ground up. We work in greenhouses and indoors and outdoors, and we would love to hear about your project. Um, so we have uh, a link, I think, well, should be below in, in the, in the yeah. session. Um, that has got a form there to fill in about your facility, about what you're looking for. Again, we'd love to hear from you. And um, yeah, uh, love to work with the first growers. And keep Great. keep uh, advancing the industry. Yeah, and if anyone has questions for Darren, um, you just want to drop them in the YouTube comments. Uh, I'll make sure to pass them along to you um, for your next book uh, where you just answer YouTube comments for <laughs> uh, pages and pages. But thank you so much today. Uh, in all seriousness, this was uh, an excellent uh, interview today where you just covered uh, a lot of questions that we've uh, seen um, over the years. So thanks, Darren. Uh, looking forward to working together, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Thanks for having me. appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today on the Cannacribs podcast, brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have five categories we want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Starting with Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticultural Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Post Harvest by Green Bros, and the Dispensary category by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create this podcast and bring more knowledge to your garden. If you want to support the Canna Cribs podcast, head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. While you're there, check us out on Instagram and join the Growers Network Forum to meet growers all around the world just like you. Happy growing.